morning. Our first reading this morning is from the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 12 through 26, and it can be found on page 1080 and 2188 of the large print. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers, The company of persons was in all about 120, and said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which is the Holy Spirit, spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. For he was a man acquired a fee, and for he was numbered among us and was allotted to share in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his bowels gushed out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the field was called in their own language, a Akeldama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, May his camp become desolate, and let there be no one to dwell in it. And let another take his office. So one of the men who accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning with the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two, Joseph called Barsabas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, you Lord, who knew, know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place of his ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm today is Psalm 1, and can be found on page 528 and in the large print, 1,086, and we'll read it responsibly. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by the streams of water, that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and all that he does he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff when the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading this morning comes from 1 John chapter 5, verses 9 through 15, and can be found on page 1,213 and 2,453 of the large print. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater, for this is the testimony of God that he has borne concerning his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar, because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his Son. And this is the testimony, that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. 
And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise to the gospel. Our gospel for this morning is uh, taken from the book of John, chapter 17. We're going to begin at verse 11b, and that's found on page 1073 of your pew Bibles, if you'd like to join along. Glory to you, O Lord. And I, the words of Jesus, I, and I am in the, no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I'm coming to you, Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you. And these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they may also be sanctified in truth. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let's open, please, with just a word of prayer. King of all creation, thank you for this new day. Thank you for the warmer weather and for the needed moisture. Thank you for all that you grant to us as you shower upon us grace upon grace. Open our hearts and minds this morning to hear again the promises that you have made for us, given to us. We thank you, Lord, for our mothers and, Lord, for all of those women that you've placed in our lives who have served the role of of mothers, of nurturing and bringing us to faith. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you this morning. O Lord, our rock and our refuge. Amen. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and from our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Quite a few among our gathering here tend to head south for the winter. And I've noticed something interesting here in my time at at Trinity. Every year, as this winter migration draws near, many of the conversations which I hear in the narthex are, are changed a bit. Many of these snowbirds are making final plans to ensure that their summer homes are, are being maintained and protected uh, during, during their long absence. And they are ensuring that their homes are not damaged by freezing temperatures, doing so by setting up plans with the gas company to have them top off their fuel tanks on a regular basis so that the furnace does not stop providing heat to the home. Just so you know, that's not always infallible. (laughs) I I went to one house where the water was coming out the kitchen window. It had frozen and and so. Um, Yeah, but you you all, as you're traveling, you make make arrangements, don't you? You make arrangements for a trusted friend to stop by on a regular basis. You make arrangements to see that the driveway is plowed so that the bad guys, which tend to drive around in the wintertime, looking for y'all, they, they, they can't tell if you're home or not, because it's plowed. And y'all leave 
detailed instructions for, for people to, hey, check on this, do this, do that, right? You just want to take care of your homes. They, they, they want, you've been blessed with this, and you desire to protect your investment. The Apostle John today writes of the depths of Jesus' concern for us as he's preparing to wrap up his earthly ministry, that ministry of ensuring our salvation. He's making sure that plans are in place to protect you and me, his followers, as he ascends to heaven. We continue to celebrate that ascension every year, 40 days after Easter. So this past Thursday, we celebrated Christ's ascension. And what is Jesus doing in preparation for his departure? Well, he's praying. He's praying to God the Father, commending to him the care of the apostles and his disciples and for all who will ever come to faith in him, and that includes you and me. Jesus even prays for himself. These words of Jesus this morning are often referred to as the high priestly prayer. And this prayer is actually a revelation of what Jesus has been up to since he ascended into heaven. Where he is now seated at the right hand of God the Father. In praying for us on the night before he goes to the cross, Jesus is revealing to us that he is praying for you and me. And he's mediating between God, the Father, and us even now. <clears throat> How awesome the thought is that. When Jesus is praying to God, the Father, in our reading this morning, he's only hours from the cross. His time in what we call his state of humiliation which is church speak for the years that Jesus walked among us doing his work of our salvation. And this was the time when he chose not to fully use his divine attributes, meaning that he did not fully utilize his powers as God. But he did use those attributes when they were required for our salvation, didn't he? One of those attributes was omniscience meaning that Jesus knows everything. On this night in which he's betrayed, Jesus uses this omniscience. He knew that Jesus was going to do an evil deed. And so Jesus sends his betrayer on his way, telling him, what you are going to do, do quickly. He knows what he's going to have to endure the next day. And even knowing these things, for whom was Jesus concerned? You and me. His disciples. In his omniscience, Jesus knew that he would be leaving his spiritual children. Knowing that he was no longer going to walk among them as her protector, Jesus asks his father that, that he would be with them and protect them. Jesus knew from first-hand experience the hatred of the world toward his message, and he realized that the world would hate his followers as well. If you became a Christian believing that everything's going to be hunky-dory, and that everybody's going to love you, most of us have experienced exactly the opposite. And, but we read, if the world hates you, no that it has hated me before it hated you. Our Savior knew that this world would hate his followers because they belong to him, not to the world. This world is controlled by Satan. As we read in John 12, 31, the time of judgment for the world has come and the time when Satan, the prince of this world, shall be cast out. Satan's goal his stated goal, if you look in, to, in uh, uh, Job, is to lead the children of God away from faith. Knowing the attacks which would be launched by Satan against those who follow Jesus, Christ prays for all of his father, 
followers, asking that his Father would protect them. God the Father had given these disciples to Jesus in the first place. And Jesus, for his part, had done everything in his power to protect them. Jesus declares, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father has given them to me. I'm sorry, my Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and my Father are one. This is another of Jesus' divine attributes, omnipotence, being almighty. With this divine attribute, he could have protected his children, his followers, by simply taking them out of this evil world, but he didn't. Better yet, Jesus prayed for them, saying, I do not ask, Father, that you take them out of this evil world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Isn't that the same thing in the prayer that, that Jesus taught us? Every time we say the Lord's Prayer, we say, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And prayer is strong protection indeed, brothers and sisters. Again, this prayer that we're talking about here is known as the high priestly prayer because it is reflective of Jesus' role as our high priest. In the Old Testament, the role of the high priest was that of an intercessor between mankind and God. Because people were sinful, they weren't able to stand before God, so they needed someone to stand between them to mediate for them. And so these Jewish priests were chosen. And even though the Jewish priests were sinners, just like you and me, in love, God appointed them for the very purpose, to be our mediator. And since these human priests were sinners as well, they too ultimately experienced the wages of their own sin, which is physical death. But Jesus, our high priest, is different. He alone is perfect and sinless. He did not die to, he did not deserve to die on that cross. But for our sake, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus died the death of a criminal, a death that you and I truly deserved. When Jesus prayed in verse 19, and for their sake I consecrate myself, this was the sacrifice of the cross that our high priest offered with his prayer to the Father. Because of that sacrifice offered by God's only beloved Son, God the Father hears Jesus' prayer. And did God the Father respond to his Son's prayer to protect his children? Absolutely. Did Jesus, Jesus himself became the answer to his own prayer. How? Well, first, God's wrath towards sinners was satisfied by Jesus on the cross. The sinner's sins were taken by the sinless one, where they were forgiven. And second, his resurrection from the grave defeated the ultimate enemy of all mankind, and that's death. Death can no longer bully God's children. While it is true that unless Christ returns for us beforehand, these earthly bodies will die, but our souls will be with God, waiting to be reunited as our bodies are resurrected at Christ's coming again. But what about Satan and his demons? Jesus' victory on the cross has vanquished them. They have already lost the war. Yet knowing that they are already defeated, the prince of this world will continue to do his best to harass God's chosen people, drawing as many of them away from Christ as they can. 
So God sends his Holy Spirit to be with the children of God as we struggle in this world. We don't have to go it alone. The Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, is active within all believers, strengthening their faith and preserving our lives. And Jesus also prayed, though, for our unity. You see, as children of God, we not only have the Holy Spirit in our hearts, but we are blessed to have fellow believers for mutual consolation. That's why a praying Savior asked his Father for unity among his children. And Satan will do whatever he can to destroy this church by schisms and by factions among Christians. And the fact is, Jesus assures us that even the gates of hell cannot overcome his church. It ain't going to happen. But true unity in the Christian church can only be created by God himself. True unity is the divine act of Jesus Christ himself. You see, we're not talking about an artificial or, or superficial unity here, but true concord. Many of us have heard about the word concordia, and what does it mean? It means from or with the heart. The hearts of believers are truly united in faith in Jesus Christ. And what does Christian unity look like? Just think of the blessing as we come here for communion this morning. We will all kneel as beggars before this altar, kneeling together, and each of us is seeking, seeking the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ so that we might hear again the promise that is in our receiving, that our sins are forgiven. Or think maybe of the, the death of a loved one in the Lord and recall how brothers and sisters in Christ gathered to console you to support and encourage you in that time, serving as ha God's hands and feet for you at that time. Living reminders that Jesus has promised that he will never leave you, he will never forsake you, ever. Or maybe you've been ill, and you felt the body of believers as they gather around to support and encourage you through their prayers. It's possible that a casserole arrived at your front door as a small token of the love of Christ presented in this small but tangible gift. My brothers and sisters in Christ, our Savior not only prayed for us, but he continues to pray for us. Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God imploring his Father to protect us and to unify us. The Apostle John who recorded this prayer of Jesus also wrote in his first epistle, we have, and this is present tense, mind you, in the Greek, this is prison to present tense, meaning it's for you right now. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Jesus, his prayer in this text is ongoing. Jesus is still praying for you at this very moment. And Christ's prayer is being answered even now. Not just as the disciples' lives were changed, but by ours. Christ not only forgave us, but he continues to forgive us. And he continues to love us. Christ is not only protect the disciples, but he's protecting you and me, even as we sit in these four walls this morning. And that prayer bound the first Christians together in the unity of faith, and it still unites us as brothers and sisters in Christ, albeit sinful ones. We are united in Christ with all who believe in Jesus Christ. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. End of story. Our praying Savior will never abandon us. He is with us. When we celebrate the Lord's Supper here again in just a few moments, his body and blood are there so that we can taste him and be strengthened, taste and see that the Lord is good. 
And when we face difficulty on this side of eternity, we remember that heaven is our home. And our praying Savior is also our coming Savior, who will keep his promise by coming back to take us to be with him in eternal peace. And our prayer is, come, Lord Jesus. Come. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus this morning. Amen. Receive the benediction. <coughs> the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace. Amen. Amen.